gross stuff now. All right, Acts chapter 18. We're going to get into it here tonight. Uh, oh, um, Brother Jan has sent me a text telling me that he made it to, they made it to Maryland safely, and they were unloading everything today. So uh, I, I let them know that we would, uh, I would update you all and let you know uh, that, uh, that they had made it there. So it was a long drive. So anyway, and I'll, I'll, we'll revisit that situation and when we figure out what's going on with that in probably about a month, I would say, but we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe sooner, but Acts chapter 18 and verse number 18 through 21. Tonight we're going to deal with Paul's vow. And I titled this, Paul's Vow, All Things to All Men. And what exactly that really means, because that was Paul's principle in evangelism, but what it means is not what the new evangelicals uh, teach today, or the compromising evangelicals today and, and the churches today, but Paul was very strict in his practice with what that meant. And we'll kind of talk about what that meant here, what, what Paul meant by that, and why Paul made this vow, as best we can to understand it, and try to give the, the proper context to it. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Seneca, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. Father in heaven, Lord, help us as we glean great truths from your scriptures tonight. Teach us, Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit's understanding and guidance. And Lord, that you'd press upon the soul of anyone here that is not saved, that they'd come to Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those that are saved, would you, Lord, please comfort them with the scriptures and strengthen them, give them the power of God, give them strength and mercy and guidance and understanding for their walk. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why did Paul make a vow? That's a good question. That's, we come to this place where Paul, he makes a vow. Now, Paul, who's an ardent defender of the salvation by grace through faith alone, right? Uh, Paul, who's an avid defender uh, of uh, New Testament Christianity, he's the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. So Paul is not uh, dragging. We, uh, Paul, who wrote that masterful treatise on Galatia, about Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, where he deals with the law versus grace, where he teaches them, who I believe wrote Hebrews as well, and explains the law and that Christ is greater than all these things, right? Uh, why did Paul have this vow, or why did he keep this vow? Why did he do this? Well, number one, you have to understand that Paul was a Jewish man. He never stopped being a Jewish man when he was saved. He, ne he never had to stop being Jewish when he was saved. Okay, he was a saved Jew. He came to Christ, and he was a Hebrew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? Uh, touching the law blameless, he said. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't dependent upon that for his eternal salvation. He was dependent on Christ alone for that. But he didn't forsake everything uh, from the temple in the sense of he didn't forsake uh, the, the ceremonies and, and some of those other things as if they were just terrible things. He was a Jew still. He grew up, and he was he grew up in that, and he and he was circumcised the eighth day, right? And so he grew up that way, just like Jesus preached the gospel. But Jesus still practiced those things, right? Why? Because he was Jewish. He was Jewish. There's nothing wrong with that. This lesson affords us some wonderful examples of how we ought to conduct ourselves in our own evangelism. Because Paul, is, he has a specific reason for why he's dealing with this vow, why he has this vow, why he makes this vow, and where he is going and what he is doing. See, later on in chapter 21, we're going to find that the Apostle Paul, he goes back to Jerusalem again, and he gets himself into some trouble. Uh, trouble finds Paul wherever he goes. If you preach the gospel, that'll be true about you too. You, it'll find you. Trouble will find you. You won't have to look very hard for it. 
it will come looking for you. It always does, right? But Paul, he's preaching and he's, he's dealing with Jews. When in, in chapter 21, which we'll get to someday, uh, he's, he's dealing with James. And James, at his behest, asked Paul, Paul, do this. Not for eternal salvation, not for justification by faith, our justification, our self-righteousness, or righteousness by the law, but do this concerning the Jews that are around. Because they're using it because you're Jewish. So they're going to use... If you act like a Gentile when you're a Jew and you come here and you do this, they're going to, I mean, they're going to eat you alive. And th then they're just going to cause trouble for us. Remember, people are dying there. People, the Jews are, eventually take James, the pastor, and they take him up to the pinnacle of the temple and they throw him off the temple. Oh, you're like your brother, huh? <laughs> Brains crashed on the ground, right? Amen. That's what happened. That's what it stated. They threw him off the pinnacle of the temple. What do you think they did that for? Why do you think they took him to the pinnacle of the temple and threw him off? Yeah, to mock who? Christ. What did Satan do? He took Jesus up what? To the top, didn't they? Now, we know that's history. We can't prove that James was that from the scriptures, but we know that he was martyred. And his enemies don't really have a reason to lie about how they did it. Because... They took pride in how they did it, so they made sure you know it. Just like when the Roman Catholics persecuted the Anabaptists, they made sure you knew how they did it and how absolutely gritty they did it and how disgusting they did it and to detail upon detail of how they did it down to scraping the skin off of their bodies, scalping them and everything else. So their, their enemies wanted them to know that. They wanted, they, they wanted everybody to know this is what they did to them. The Romans weren't shy about things like that at all, period. Anyway, so we are not Jewish. We don't live in a Jewish nation. We don't evangelize to Jews. We're not Jewish people. We're Gentiles. Paul never asked the Gentiles to ever take a vow. He never expected them to take a vow. He never asked them. In fact, uh, when, that, when that certain came from James, right, it was very clear what they were supposed to do, right? Very clear. The bulk of the people that we come across will be Gentiles, pagans, and Greeks in their thought process. Paul's goal was never to needlessly offend others and cause them to shut him off right away so they could not hear his message. Paul was a Jewish believer. I believe that Paul lived by a, by a principle as the apostle of the Gentiles, and this is how this, this principle played out. In 1 Corinthians 9, turn there. It, this principle governed his conduct. As we go to the streets, this story affords us some wonderful lessons to learn and consider as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 19. We'll be there for about four or five verses here. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, which is like right now. When he was going to, he was going and he was going to go to the synagogue and he was going to evangelize. He was going into, he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to evangelize, right? And he's like, you know what? I got to be wise. I'm a Jew. They know I'm a Jew. I'm a saved Jew, but I'm a Jew and they know it. So I'm not going to walk around like a Gentile and needlessly offend them. But my Gentile companions don't have to do that. Right? And by the way, neither did Priscilla and Aquila, who were Jews. They didn't have to do it either, and I'll show you that. So Paul did this personally on his own. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. This is really the right application of being all, all things to all men, right? It's not to sit down and drink booze with them or to become a wicked sinner like them. Paul didn't compromise Paul didn't follow, um, Paul didn't sacrifice animals, right? He didn't go do that. 
He didn't, he didn't practice any of those things. He already knew the blood atonement was Christ. But what he did, he saw no harm in, in shaving his head and making this vow and to go into Jerusalem that way. He, he didn't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong with it either as a Jewish man for him to do that. Right? It didn't mean that he changed his evangelism. He didn't water down the gospel to get other men to accept it. Or turn the church into the world and have a rock concert to be all things to all men, so I'll turn into Satan for them. He didn't do that. That's not what he meant. He didn't mean transform yourself into, into, into Satan for them and make them like the gospel. That's not what Paul was doing. Paul was a Jewish man. He was going to evangelize Jews. He knew what the Jews believed. Right? Paul had a very deep love and a burden for the lost Jews, and he never lost that burden. Some of our brethren that tried to say that Paul was making a change to Gentiles only are proven wrong just by this verse right here, that he goes into the synagogue and he reasons with them again. So they say, oh, this is where Paul's done with the Jews. No, he wasn't done with them. He was done with them in Corinth, and he moved on because he found, figured out that it wasn't profitable. But as soon as he gets to the next town, what's on his heart? The Jews to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That was on his heart. He could not, he just could not. And God never really let him directly fulfill that burden. But indirectly, he always did. But directly, he never was able to fulfill that. Ever what he wanted to do like that. He was never able to do that. But indirectly, he was. God used him for that purpose, which we'll see this weekend, next week a little bit. Paul never lost his burden. Paul shorn or shaved his head to keep the feast in Jerusalem. He never attached any saving grace to the vow that he had made. He never added the gospel to it. And when he was evangelizing the Gentiles, he never put any requirement on them like the Hebrew roots people do. They attach salvation. They attach commands to keep the Old Testament ceremonial laws. And if you don't do that, then you're not saved, right? That's what the Hebrew roots do. That's not what Paul did here. Paul did not do anything near that. In fact, Paul fought those men that, wanted, that added circumcision to the gospel. He fought them that added Old Testament law to the gospel. He fought them very firmly and, and consistently and, and with a lot of heat and passion. Paul was not compromising the gospel. He was not adding to grace. He was simply honoring a custom of the people. He was witnessing to and their culture because it did not violate the scriptures or the doctrine of grace to do that. He figured out as he looked at that and he examined that, it doesn't, I'm not violating scripture. I'll give you a perfect example of that. That's like during a parade why I don't think it's very profitable to preach. I just don't think it is. First of all, no one listens to you. They can't hear you. They just, so, what, so what I learned was the best thing to do that I believed was the best thing to do is to hand out gospel tracts and get thousands of them out while, they're, while the parade's going on and then preach afterwards, right? Or maybe you don't get to preach. You still handed out thousands of gospel tracts. You can go somewhere else and preach, but you still hand them out. Instead of preaching and they're not even, they can't even hear you most of the time. They can't even hear you. They got the speakers loud, the music's blasting, people are doing backflips down the, down the parade and everything else like that. There's no compromise in that. There isn't any compromise in me not standing up with a bullhorn and preaching while these people are distracted by something already that they're not going to listen to it. Right? That they're just not, you're, you're not going to garner their attention. Neither am I saying it's a sin if you decide that you want to preach at that. That's okay. You can preach at it too if you want to. I'm just telling you that what I found is it hasn't been very profitable. It just usually makes people mad. And they don't really listen to you. They can't really hear you anyway. So, especially because their speakers are going to be a lot louder than ours, for the most part. But, is that a hard, fast rule? No. Is it a compromise? No, I don't believe so. Not in my heart it isn't. It doesn't, it doesn't, I, don't, I don't believe it is. I don't believe the scriptures say that, that, that's, that we're violating anything by doing that. But, uh, and afterwards, uh, we, we preach the gospel. So, he wasn't adding, he was using wisdom. He wasn't adding grace, he was simply honoring them. He didn't violate the gospel. So he says, I don't need to make the Jews mad on purpose. I don't need to cause them to turn a deaf ear to me as soon as they see me, right? My goal is to preach the gospel to them that they would hear it. I'm not committing blasphemy against the Lord. And Paul was not saying that all Gentiles should do this. Never does he say it anywhere. Because very clearly he's going to Jews. He's teaching to the Gentiles to follow. He, he never teaches to the Gentiles to follow Old Testament law. Never teaches them that. Never teaches them that they need to be Hebrews, ever. 
fact, he tells the Jews, you're not even good at being Jews. You can't even be a good Jew, so how in the world do you expect them to be? You can't even keep the law. And you expect these Gentiles to keep the law, right? Paul's saying, I don't have to do any of these things. I'm not in bondage to them, but it does not violate my principles, so I will use wisdom and I will be kind. There's nothing wrong in being smart. There's nothing wrong with being wise, with using wisdom when you do things. There's, it, it, it's not a sin that you don't run headfirst into a fire and burn yourself up. That's, that's, it's okay that you don't do that Amen. in the name of God. It's, it's okay, right? Amen. Fools for Christ doesn't mean that we throw all caution to the side and we're not wise as serpents, Amen. right? Sometimes it's like sometimes when you're out there preaching, it's a good time to know when to leave. Time to go. Right? Sometimes that's, God shows that to us. Amen. Another example would be if I was around some lost Jews and I dined with them or they came to my home, I wouldn't serve them pork just to offend them. I, would, I, wouldn't, do, I wouldn't serve them something that would offend them. Right? Why, or a Muslim. Right? Somebody like that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to offend them on purpose. Or if I was, or if I was, going to a Muslim's house and I was going to go witness to them, uh, they take their shoes off. It's, that's, that's something that's very, and, you know, we do in Minnesota a lot anyway, but, but, but they, they take their shoes off. So, you know, doing that is not offensive. It's not, it's not, I'm not worshiping a false god because I take my shoes off. I'm being kind. I, I, I don't, I'm not worshiping their god. I'm just being nice, right? It's okay. You don't have to be a jerk about everything. It's okay. <laughs> Right? You don't just have to make people mad just to say you made them mad and like put a score on a scoreboard and just put a point up for yourself. Right? Right. Or that you're more spiritual, right? Like you follow the letter of the law to the T, right, when it comes to that, which totally is void of the, you know, I'm not compromising by not, not barbecuing pork butts when they come over, right? Like, here we go. It's time for pork butts for the Muslims and the Jews. Right. That, you know, I don't have to do that. The Hebrew Roots Movement, though, they twist this and they drag the Gentiles back under the Old Testament law. And they say, no, this is what you have to do. Paul never said anyone had to make... In fact, there are no New Testament instructions for making a vow like that. In fact, there's some for not making a vow, <laughs> you know, not promising things that you can't keep. You know what I mean? And we'll get to that at the end of this. But uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement... Uh, and being careful about what you vow, right? Being careful about what you promise. By the way, that's a script. All the way through the scriptures, the Bible warns us, be careful what you're promising, right? Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. The Bible talks about. Be more ready to offer the sacrifice of pray, or the offering of praise than the sacrifice of fools, right? Now, God's people can be awful lazy when they look at scripture. They see one verse or one happening in Scripture, and then they run and make a doctrine out of it, and they don't study the entire subject through the Scriptures. It's very poor workmanship, and it leads to many cults and many false doctrines and many errors because they don't rightly divide what they're seeing. This is studying to show yourself approved unto God and understanding what Paul's saying, not burning everything down in two sections and applying it all the same way. That's what people do. They look at the Bible and they say, oh, it's either... This or that, and there's nothing. That's not always the case, though. There are some things that God explains to us, and circumstances. And no, we don't believe in circumstantial theology or anything like that. We don't change our principles. Our principles never change, right? They stay the same. You just have to determine whether what you're doing is violating Bible commands or principles, right? Amen. That's the difference. What you think might be a violation that somebody's doing may not be a violation at all. It just means the way you understand it, that's what you've come to. Number two, Paul's decision was expedient to the Jews at Ephesus. When he gets there, and he came to Ephesus, verse 19, and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So he drops off Priscilla and Aquila, who were Jews. Well, why didn't they have the shorn head, and why didn't they go with him? Because they weren't a part of it. Paul did this personally as he was headed to Jerusalem. And he also did it as he was headed to, this, to Ephesus as he was going here because he knew he was going to preach to Jews. Maybe it was because of the dust up he had back in Corinth. Maybe he started thinking a little bit and using a little more wisdom. Man, i got to be wise about this. That, that 
that almost got real ugly, right? It did get real ugly. That got real bad in Corinth. Those Jews started a rumble. It was bad. Maybe he was thinking about that, you know. We don't know that for sure exactly. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So he goes in and he contends for Christ among the Jews. Now the feast was probably more, more than likely it was the Passover that he was headed to Jerusalem for. We know that Paul did not always observe the Passover because he was 18 months in uh, Corinth and he didn't observe it there. The Bible gives us no record of him observing it. He didn't head off to Jerusalem to observe it. So again, this isn't some biblical standard for New Testament Christians that you have to observe the Passover or you have to, you're not a Jew. Or I don't think any of you are, okay? And, and you weren't raised that way and that's not, and you're not evangelizing Jews and you're not in Jerusalem, right, where everybody wants to kill you anyway. Uh, Paul is like the most wanted man in Jerusalem. If Paul steps foot in Jerusalem, he is the most wanted man in Jerusalem. As soon as he steps his foot inside Jerusalem, he is wanted dead or alive. He has many a target upon his head. So he's, I think he's trying to be wise about what he's doing. He's trying to not set people off, right, for no reason at all. He goes in there and he contends. Paul uses that vow and shorn head being a Jew to preach to the Jews in Ephesus. You'll notice, though, he left Priscilla and Aquila there at Ephesus. He didn't take them with him to the synagogue. He left them there with the believers at Ephesus, and he, he, he went in and preached to them. I think it's probably because it was too dangerous for them to go because he just wasn't sure what, what was going to happen. Paul was not sure if, you know, and he's, later he says that they laid down their necks for his sake, right? That they, they put their own neck on the line for his sake. And uh, he says they, they were loyal to him, but he wanted to make sure. He's like, I don't want to put them. Paul was very careful not to put them in harm's way needlessly, right? So he's being very cautious as he comes here, and he's using wisdom. And in chapter 21, he does the same thing when visiting Jerusalem in order that James and the church of Jerusalem doesn't have to deal with all the crazy accusations from the Jews. And by the way, if, if, if Paul didn't handle things correctly, he gets to leave town, but James has to deal with the, the fallout, yep. right? So Paul knows that. So Paul's going to respect that local New Testament church in Jerusalem, and he's not going to, he's not going to set them off. Paul's not going to set them off and, you know, make them needlessly mad, not over the gospel, but over the fact that he doesn't respect uh, you know, the Jewish customs, being a Jew. No, I, th I think, regard well, I think regardless of what Paul did, persecution was going to be there, okay? But Paul learned to kind of, after you go through that, you learn to slow down and take a look and be like, hmm, I better be a little wiser about how I do this. So I, the scripture doesn't say that he made a ton of mistakes with that, but maybe he learned there's a difference in making mistakes that cause something or sinning to cause something and you just learning from what happened, the situation, stepping back and kind of saying, you know what, I think I could learn, I, I think if we handle it this way, this would be better. You see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's actually growing in maturity, you, you, learning what you're doing. Right, 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 because more pe what we learned was more people will take tracks without those, and my guys over here can have all the scripture signs, the banners, the preaching, and everything else. Those guys are tracting. They're trying to get as many tracks out as they can. That's their goal. Now, some people don't like that, and I'm okay with that. You don't have to like it, but I'm going to do it anyway because I know it's profitable and there's nothing wrong with it. There is no scripture that says thou must carry a scripture sign when thou goest in and handest out tracts. And if thou, do, if thou does not, thou art a heathen. Right? It doesn't say that anywhere, right? Right? So I, I've just learned that it's, it works, and it works well to do that. And, we, and our numbers of tracts went up how many? I mean, just by the hundreds, thousands. By the thousands, they went up by doing that. 
Because they don't, they're not like, oh, you're with them, you're done. But these, they're going like this, and they, they're just putting it in their pocket, and one guy just, someday, you know, we don't know. We'll see him in heaven. Amen. We'll see him in heaven. But just like people like Ickes and Pastor, Pastor Ickes and, and uh, Pastor Beller, both those men were saved same way, chick tracks that were left somewhere. He picked one off his friend's bathroom floor. Read it and got saved. Right? So, uh, anyway. But, so we, we don't, we can be wise. It's okay. It's not a compromise to be wise. Right? It's not. You know? So Paul knew that. So Paul was going into Jerusalem this next time. I think more, Andrew, what it is, is the last time he, one of the last times he was in Jerusalem, they lowered him down a basket and got him out of there. So he knew that he was not, I mean, yeah, he knew what was going to happen, so he's wiser about it. Um, yeah, and he was always trying to go to Jerusalem, always. I always want to go to Jerusalem. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with using your brains, and compassion and kindness is not a sin. Paul leaves Priscilla and Aquila with the Gentiles. And then he goes in evangelism like we talked about. He knew how to deal with them. It's important that we know who we're preaching to. Paul knew who he was preaching to. He understood that, right? Paul didn't believe a vow was some mandatory Hebrew roots law to keep. Like, you've got to keep this. Like, this is the law of God, and you have to follow it. That's not what Paul was doing. Remember, he, was, he talked about custom to whom custom is due, pro, uh, uh, honor to whom honor is due, um, it's just like when, when men would see a king, right? They would bow to a king. That's not a religious bow. That's not a bow of, of uh, a theocracy or... Now, when they do it to the Pope, it is. Because he claims the two, the two swords, right? So, yeah, the two keys. He claims them both, so... He says he has the, the, the uh, temporal power and the spiritual power, right? But people that did that to kings, to honor, to custom kings, and, you know, or, or even people said things about Obama when, when he shook the, the J Japanese person and he bowed like this or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just being a petty, stupid moron. Shut up. He didn't even do anything wrong. <laughs> it's just dumb. It's because he's, he's a D and that guy's an R. And it's just, so what, Trump walks around like a cocky New York guy and he doesn't bow? Big deal. But he goes over to the Pope and he bows to him. I guarantee you that. Kissed his pinky finger probably and everything else. But um, so it's just, it's just it's, it, it, that's all fodder. It's stupid stuff. Right. Right. Well, that's like when he was talking to the high priest, right? And he said, and he talked, he didn't know he was the high priest, and he apologized. He said, oh, I didn't know you were the high priest. <laughs> I guess I'm sorry. <laughs> but he, because he didn't know, he didn't know that's who it was, because the way he was acting, he wasn't acting like one. So he told him, you know, I didn't know you, I didn't know you were the high priest. But, um, Anyway, so there's, when you look at those things, it's like sometimes people, I'm just going to say it, sometimes people use this book to just rebel. They just use the Bible to rebel against everything. That's just, they just use it to rebel against everything. They'll use it to fight and be contrary. They'll use God's word just to be contrary for the sake of being contrary. That's not what God's commanded us to do. That's, that's not how we're to be, right? We don't, we don't have to you know, be that way to be good Christians or to say that we're contending for the faith, just being contrary to everything. Live peaceably with all men. That's right. So there's, there's, you know, there, we don't have to be, be like that all the time with that. We don't have to be contentious all the time. Romans 9, 1, Paul said this. I think this has to do with his vow, by the way. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, 
who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Here's a man with a very heavy burden. And he's saying, you know, the, the, the Holy Ghost beareth me witness, you know. <laughs> My conscience is clear in this matter. This is, I am so burdened, I would rather die and go to hell than see them go to hell, right? That's a man that had a lot of love. He had a heavy burden. You know, that's a man that, that, so you have to understand what he's doing for the Jews like that. That's why he took up the offerings for the Jews. That's why the, the poor Jews, he, he went to the Gentile churches. He said, we got to take up an offering. The Jews are starving. We got to take up an offering for them and we got to take it up to James and we got to have the local church distribute that out to everybody because they're poor. So you got to, you got to take up this offering for them, right? So he taught them to, to, to help those that were in need there and those Jews because he had such a burden for them. He wanted them so bad to understand the gospel. Why? Because he murdered Christians. He, he murdered them before. He was a murderer, right? And, and he was consenting unto their death, and he just wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to have the peace of God. He knew what, that they were under the law and they were cursed, right? Because they, they, they were depending on their own self-righteousness. He knew it. And it burdened him. It kept him awake at night. It filled his heart with sorrow. Right? He had a desire to keep preaching to the Jews who actually wanted him to stay in Ephesus. Those Jews at the synagogue requested, can you stay? He said, I can't. I got to go. I've got to go. But he makes a promise here that if the Lord will, I will return and preach to you. This is also another important lesson that you and I can learn. In 1 Corinthians 4, 19, Paul says something over and over again. This is something that you and I ought to pay attention to. In the service of the Lord, in our lives in general, and what we promise to people, we ought to always preface our promises like 1 Corinthians 4, 19. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. That's how you and I are to live our lives. Now, I'll finish that verse, but that's how you and I uh, should live our lives. We should not live our lives in such a presumption that we have so many years ahead of us and that we are masters of our own destinies and we are going to be able to do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it. Remember, that's the one thing that Jesus said to Peter. He goes, man, when you were young, Peter, you did whatever you wanted to do, wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, uh-uh. You're going to be given for the sheep when you're old. You're not going to do what you want to do, Peter. You're not going to do what you want to do. Your, your self, your, your self uh, uh, drive and initiative and, 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 and all of those things are going to be honed down into feeding the sheep. They're not going to be your aspirations and, and everything else. They're going to be confined to to the ministry, that, the servant ministry that God has called you to, right? But if I, I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. I like that. <laughs> James 4, 13, another lesson for us. James says the same thing. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas, you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know. Man, we don't know. You know, that could be a fearful thing when you're an anxious person, when you have anxiety and different things like that. Thinking about tomorrow and thinking about, uh, about uh, uh, you know, what that holds for us. But the Bible says sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Right, that you take care of today. You you be concerned with today. Right? Be concerned with serving the Lord today. Tomorrow will come eventually. But God gives grace to fight today's battles. And he'll give grace to fight tomorrow's when tomorrow comes. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You know, you're not promised tomorrow. There's no promise in the scriptures that gives you tomorrow. You could die tonight. You could die today. You could die any time. If you die without Christ, then you're going to hell, very plainly, very simply. If you die without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you will perish in the lake of fire for all of eternity. 
if you do not turn to Christ and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you do not trust Him, the one who died on the cross for your sins and that was buried and that rose again from the dead, the one that gave his life a ransom for your soul, the one that makes life worth living, amen? Every day is worth living because of Christ. Every day you wake up is a day worth living because of Jesus Christ. But if you don't have that true purpose of heart because you don't have Christ, then you won't be able to see that. I'll tell you this, I thank God that I did not go through the depression that I have seen other men go through uh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go through it as a lost man. Oh, my goodness. I do not know if I would have made it. I don't believe I would have, right? I, I don't believe I would have. I believe that would have, it would have killed me, right? But because of Christ, because of His grace, and because I was saved, there was that hope. There was always hope that could never... There was always a floor to that grief. There was always a floor to that sorrow. There is always a floor. And if you don't know where that is, it's because you're not looking for it. That's why you cry out to Christ in the dark. That's what you do. You don't cry out to yourself. You don't sorrow in yourself. You sorrow unto the Lord. You cry out to Him. Christ is the one that lifts the floor up. Christ is the one that keeps you from falling. Christ is the one that gives you grace. And if you're searching for it anywhere else, you are not going to find it. You are never going to find it. You will never find it outside of Christ. You will never find it without looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. You will never be strengthened how God wants you to be unless you seek after Christ, unless he is your all in the dark, unless you are searching for him. You know, you'll sit and play mind games with yourself and what if games with yourself and you'll roll that stuff around in your head until you have so much despair. Why don't you get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on God? Why don't you look straight in the face of the glory of God in Jesus Christ? Why don't you get your mind and heart there instead of on yourself? You are doing yourself no good by looking to yourself, reasoning with yourself. No, no. You reason with the Lord. Despair, despair is killed, is put down by grace. It is put down by the presence of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! That's where it's put down. I know it! I know it! I know it because I lived it and I do live it every day of my life. And I know the person that's mind and heart is not fixed on Christ is sinking in the sand. So whether you're lost or saved, if you're lost, you better run for the boat now. You better swim for it. You better get on board and get saved by the grace of God. If you are saved, then you better keep your eyes on Christ. Because if you think this is a storm, you ain't seen nothing yet. There is more to come. There is more battles, more wars, more raging, more fire, more despair, more destruction coming upon this earth. And you need to build your relationship with Jesus Christ strong on the firm foundation. Amen. Amen. That's what you need right now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year, but right now. That's where true faith takes hold. That's where we look. But you and I, if we're going to live, if, if we're going to live right, then we're going to live by this, this particular principle in life. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. Right? Anything that is not already in the plain path of duty and the will of God, anything that is not your daily duty to take up your cross and follow Christ, anything outside of that that you and I promise outside of that is presumption. That's what it is. It's presumption, right? Anything we put off for tomorrow is presumption that tomorrow will come. Anything in our sacred duty as children of God that we put off like that, then it is presumption. It is not faith, right? For the, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or, or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. 
Paul, and by the way, uh, James is saying this, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He's saying if you do that, remember we use that for a lot, we use that, that verse as a principle for a lot of different contextual things, but really the context is in this. If you're living a presumptuous life, for instance, if you are presuming that you can live in sin that grace may abound and that you have tomorrow to repent or you have the next day to repent or you have time to get right with God, you are a fool because you're not promised another moment than the breath that you have in your lungs right now. So you and I should never live in, in open rebellion to God any moment of our lives. Why? Because it could be the last moment of your life. And you don't, want to you don't want to live the last moment of your life in rebellion to God. Amen. Right? You don't want to regret that. You don't want to live in that type of regret or think about that before God wipes it all away in eternity that you didn't live right in your body. You know, we're not going to answer for sin at the judgment seat of Christ. Sin has already been paid for. You're not going to answer for sin at the judgment seat. Legally... Sin has been paid for. Past, present, and future upon the atonement of Christ. Amen. Legally justified. So when people tell you that, oh, all your sin is going to be brought up in heaven, I've never seen that. I mean, it makes a good movie, and it sounds really good, but it doesn't say that anywhere in the scriptures. What does it say? It says you're going to be judged by your works what you did in your body for the Lord, how you served him or you didn't serve him, wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones, right? That's it. If the man's works are burnt up in the fire, he is saved, yet so as by fire. See, I mean, he's justified. He's already justified. He's not going to... He's not going to hell. That's already been determined. Jesus, Jesus suffered your sins. God's not going to bring up sin Jesus paid for already. Right? Why would he? It's already paid for. What did he say he would do with sin? Separate as far as the east is from the west, right? That's what he said, didn't he? And there's sins I will remember... No more. Christ. Christ. There is no sin greater than the blood of Jesus Christ. His, his blood covers all sin. Right? You, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to, I, I would never, and I'm, I'm not even preaching this really, but I am now, I guess. Uh, but here's the thing. The, the point is this, is that I don't need to try to scare you that you're going to stand before God and answer for every sin that you ever committed. Because if you're Christians, you don't need me to say that to you. If you're born again believers and you have the Holy Ghost of God inside of you and you, and you have that, no, I don't need to say that. What do I need to say to you? But Jesus suffered for your sin. Why would you hold hands with God's enemy? Why would you, after Jesus poured his blood out for your soul, would you live a life like that? See, God's people appeal unto love, not fear. My appeal to you is, the, is an appeal of love. My appeal to you is the appeal of the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. Mine is not a, a, a fearful wrath that I would appeal to God's people with to get you to do right. My goodness, no, that's the, that's, the, that's the fear of the law that comes to curse you. And the whole reason you turn to Christ is because you're a cursed object that needs to be blessed by God and made new, right? Your soul is in jeopardy and you go to Christ and he makes you whole. And he, and he, and he legally justifies you in the eyes of God by his own sacrifice on the cross, right? So I don't need to scare you and say, well, you're going to answer for your sin when you get to heaven. No, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna pu be punished with chastening of the Lord here on this earth now. And if that don't bother you, there ain't nothing I can do for you. I mean, if you tell me you don't care about God chastening you, and you don't, you've then, you, then I tell you you never felt the chastening hand of God then. 
I'll tell you that, right? But if that, I'm not gonna tell, I'm not gonna try to scare you and say, well, you're gonna lose your salvation. You need to obey God. You need to obey, or else you're gonna lose. Why would I do that? That's not even biblical. That's no. I would appeal to the love of God. You see, the lost people want me to go to them and appeal to the love of God with them. They want me to. They want me to say what I would say to you, but I I can't, because they don't have a covenant relationship. They don't have a ring on the finger. Right? They don't have a new robe. They haven't been made in the likeness of Jesus Christ. So they need to be redeemed. My, my, my duty is to preach to you that you ought to love God enough that you don't live in sin. You ought to be thankful enough to the Holy Spirit of God for indwelling you that you would never want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that you would never want to hurt the character of God. Why do you think the greatest thing that can be said to the, to the Christian when he enters heaven is, well done, thou good and faithful servant, right? Good and faithful, right? That's what we want to hear, right? I was driving to, I think I was driving into here. I don't remember when it was, but I was listening to a song about heaven. And for whatever reason, I just busted out crying about it. I said, Lord, I'm going to see you someday. I'm going to go home someday. I'm going to go home someday and be with the Lord, and all of it is going to be over, right? One day. One day. And see, that's the, that's the difference for the Christian. We don't walk around. I mean, if, you, if, if you've been preached to that you need to run around and worry about that, that the judgment, no, the judgment seat is a wonderful place. Now, it is going to be a place of regret for us. We're going to have some regret because we'll have wish we have given him more, right? Like the song says, so much more. You'll have regret, but not sin. That's already been paid for. That's done. Right? You'll suffer loss. That loss will grieve you, but then God will wipe all tears away and it'll be over. And you'll never remember it again. For the former things will be passed away. Right? That's what God promised. But you and I are to live our lives if the Lord will. See, that's why, because we want to please God. Right? We, we don't want to fail the Lord. See, that... There isn't any accusation that anybody could make against me or a lie they could tell about me or slander they could do to me that would affect me more than if I knew that I disappointed the Lord in my service, that I failed God or that I failed you. You see, there, all that other stuff, God taught me all that other stuff is nothing. But it's love that compels us. It isn't fear. That's what he meant when he said, perfect love casteth out fear. You that have had bad fathers have a hard time looking at your heavenly father and loving him right. You don't love your father in heaven right. You look at him as, as he's, I'm going to have you read a book that John R. Rice wrote, Is God a Dirty Bully? It was a sermon that he preached. I have it in there. Boy, he had some cool looking books with covers on it. But anyway, and he was saying that, he's proving that he wasn't, right? But what he was saying is, is that that's how people view God, like he's some dirty bully with a club up in heaven that's ready to whack you every five minutes that you do something wrong. Uh-uh. Nope. That's not who God is. See, it's love, not wrath, that compels us right? Forgiveness. That's why we fear God, because of that. But we ought to live our lives. Anyway, that, that was free. Um, but now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is ev evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We are not masters of our own destiny, and we need to remember that. We're not in charge of our lives. And God is able to change any of our plans and thwart our plans or the devil's plans. That isn't fatalism, by the way. It's faith. It's, it's, it's accepting the, the sovereign will of God that he is able to do what he wants to do and what he deems right, and he is always right. Right? I remember, you know, 
when I was a young Christian, I remember listening. Um, uh, Jack Hiles preached a sermon, and, he, and, he, and it was called, I don't always agree with God, but God is always right. Right? And he talked about how he didn't always agree with God in everything that God did. David didn't either, right? There was, remember, David was angry with the Lord. Aaron was angry with the Lord, remember? I mean, I've been that way. You've been that way probably. Didn't always agree with the Lord. But God is always right. That's a very practical message, but it's very true. You know, God's going to allow things to happen sometimes, and we're not always going to agree with it, but He's always right. And we got to remember that, right? Jerusalem is not mentioned much, but Antioch is. We're almost done here, actually. Um, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after that, he had spent some time there. He departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Not much is spoken of his trip in Jerusalem. If you'll notice, it never talks about it. Talks about him going to a sending church in Antioch, right? And uh, he goes to the sending church. He gives a report, no doubt. Doesn't say that specifically, everything that he did. But I find it fascinating that Paul was always wanting to reach the Jews. He left Ephesus to reach the Jews in Jerusalem. But Paul never had the success with the Jews that he wanted. He never had it. I mean, think about it this way. Here's Peter. And Peter preaches to thousands of Jews. And how many people get saved at Pentecost? Jews? 2,000? Was it a couple thousand or was it 3,000? And then not count, was that not counting the women and children? Right. So could you imagine? Be, I mean, Paul's got to have that desire and see Peter do that. And he get, he, but check this out. But he corrects Peter when Peter's wrong, so Peter strengthens the, the Jews again, right? He goes and Peter strengthens them. And what does Peter say? Hey, listen to Paul's letter. They're inspired Bible. You listen to that. They're scripture. You listen to what Paul says. You think about that for a second. So Paul doesn't get to preach to those people. He doesn't get to strengthen those Jews directly. But he strengthens Peter, and then Peter strengthens them. That's how it always worked with the Jews with Paul. He was never allowed. Because what did God tell him in the beginning of his mission? What did he tell him? I will send you far away. Unto the Gentiles, far away. And that's what he did. But Paul was always trying to go back. <laughs> He's always trying. Huh? Yeah. He was always trying to go back and make reconciliation. He was always trying to go back. You mean, what do you mean? Oh, he dragged him to Jerusalem to be persecuted? As a Christian. Could be. I, I don't know. I know one thing. His, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, that's natural, right? I mean, that's what we'd want to do, right? We, when we're wrong, we would want to turn around and do right and make sure people knew that we were different. Not because we're bragging, but because of Christ's sake. You know, they want to know the, the power of the gospel to change. Paul believed in the power of the gospel. He believed if he preached it, people would be saved. You know, it was, it was a, tough for him. Not much is spoken of his trip, though, there. Uh, but his companions are about to be very successful. Because as we close this part of the chapter out, when we, when we begin next, we're going to talk about Apollos. And Apollos ends up doing everything that Paul wants to do. Paul wants to reach the Jews and mightily... Uh, bring the gospel to them well he doesn't get to he always gets stopped something always happens paul ends up preaching more to politicians than he did the jews right he'd stand up before noble felix right he'd stand up before uh uh herod it was wasn't it herod he stood up before all uh what's the other guy's name Festus. He stood up before all these men. He's always preaching to them. He never gets to preach to Jews, but God sent him to the prominent. God sends him, God sends him all the way to Caesar's house in Caesar's authority, and he starts churches in Caesar's house. Right? But not in Jerusalem. Not going to get to do that, Paul. There are certain things that God just doesn't let his men do, that they may have a burden to do, but he's just not going to let them. Indirect, or directly, but indirectly, he did get to. Because Apollos comes up. And you're going to find out how the Holy Ghost was in Paul shaving his head, 
going to that synagogue, leaving Priscilla and Aquila at Ephesus, because guess what? While they're in Ephesus evangelizing, they find this zealous Jew named Apollos. And Apollos is, is going to rise up and be an evangelist and preach the gospel to the Jews, and he's going to have much success when he does it. So you see how God ordered these steps. Paul had no idea that was going to happen. See, God allowed Paul to go to Jerusalem for whatever reason, and he always did allow him to go to Jerusalem, and then he'd send him to Rome or send him somewhere else, right? But it was never for what Paul thought, right? It never was Paul, what never Paul was, thought he was going to do, you know, or maybe had in his mind. God will do that to you. He might send you someplace to do some work and... You know, it never is going to be how you think it's going to be. When I came to Northfield 14 years ago, it was never going to be, it was never the way that I thought it was going to be, right? I mean, I, I look back 14 years later, now, going into our 15th year, right? That I'm looking back and I'm like, this was never how I imagined it, you know, ever, right? When I, when I came here, um, before Lee saw this church or anything else, he was looking to get out of here, right? But had he done that, his wife wouldn't be saved, right? And now his children and a whole family. Now, when they came, it was just those two. A lot of extras come along here, right? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, we, we don't know what God's going to do and how much God has used him and Carrie in this church, right? So, I mean, it's just those things that, that happen. We don't know why they happen, you know, but God does. God's in charge, right? He knows. And uh, we can't control how God answers our prayers, can we? It's important for you to understand that God answered Paul's prayers. His burden was met, but it wasn't met through himself. It was going to be met through others. Here's the point, and let's remember this. You and I, you and I are responsible for being obedient and being faithful. You never know when we go out and hand out gospel tracts and preach the gospel. We pray for our children to be saved, right? Right? God sees that, and He sees our burden, and God knows that we want to see our children saved. And when we're actively seeking the salvation of others, God's going to answer those prayers. He's going to save those children. Why do we believe that? We believe it by faith. We believe the Scriptures. But we also, why do we believe that? Because God honors obedience. God honors His Word, right? He does honor His Word, and He, and he, and he answers prayer. And it may not be the way that you think it should be answered, right? It may not be the way that you want it answered, but he answers it. Sometimes it's through much affliction. Paul wanted to reach those people, right? He wanted to reach them bad, and he didn't get to. And all he did was go through affliction after affliction after affliction after affliction, and then Apollos walks right in and preaches, and a bunch of them get saved, right? Right? So we have to just be obedient and faithful to the Lord. Pray for one another. Go out and preach the gospel and believe that God's going to save. Right? We have to believe that. We have to trust the Lord. That we labor. That God's going to... We don't know what God's going to do and how He's going to work on hearts. So it matters that you pray. It matters how you do the evangelism. Like Paul, he didn't needlessly offend people just for no reason, just for the sake of offending them. He was careful with them. And, and we ought to try our best to do that, too. Um, that's not always going to happen. Sometimes people have to hear some straight stuff. But um, we need to be in prayer one for another, though. And then we need to go and be faithful and watch God give the increase. That's what happened. Paul learned that lesson later on. He says it to the Corinthians, right? One watered, right? I have planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. That's how it works. Amen? That's how it works. Trust the Lord. He's always right. Father, Lord, thank you.
Thank you for your word, how it teaches us. Even just a few simple verses, Lord. So many lessons. Help us, Lord. Strengthen our church. Protect us and guide us. Keep us in your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.